Okay, this is chapter 8, and we're going to be talking about momentum, impulse, and collisions. So up until this point, we've talked about Newton's laws, we've talked about forces, we've talked about energy, and the new concept for this chapter is going to be this thing called momentum, which is related to an object's mass and to its velocity, as well as some of the forces that are behind it. The important part of this chapter is going to be using conservation of momentum, more specifically looking at collisions, which actually occur a lot more frequently than you might think in real life. We'll talk about the center of mass and how to determine that for a system and how it moves. It's also related to momentum. And we'll very briefly talk about rocket rocket propulsion, at least in a very general way. So in a lot of situations, for example, this bullet hitting this carrot here, uh, we can use Newton's sec, well, we, in theory, we could use Newton's second law to solve the problems. But in reality, we actually don't know a whole lot about the forces that are involved. Uh, what is the frictional drag of the bullet going through the carrot? How dense is the carrot? And so on and so forth. So to solve these types of problems, it turns out that we can solve complicated problems that Newton's second law may not be able to solve using this idea of momentum. And more specifically, looking at the conservation of momentum for such systems. So this beast called momentum is simply going to be the product of its of an, um, of a particle's mass multiplied by its velocity, and it's written by a lowercase p, simply going to be a mass times the velocity. You can see that it is a vector quantity and that it is in the same direction as the velocity. The units for this guy is going to be a kilogram meter per second coming from the product of the mass and the velocity and if we think about a couple of uh, objects moving with the same velocity obviously a Mack truck that is moving with a velocity of 10 miles per hour is going to ha have a lot more momentum than a VW bug moving with a velocity of 10 miles per hour it simply has more momentum. The interesting thing is we can write this also in terms of Newton's second law where if we have an object's momentum and I'm going to break out some calculus for you now and I take the derivative of this beast called the momentum I can rewrite the momentum as the mass times the velocity so I'm taking the time derivative of the mass times the velocity. And if we assume that mass is relatively a constant, I can pull it out of that derivative there. And we're left with mass times the derivative of velocity. If you haven't yet had calculus, then you could just think about this being as the mass multiplied by the change in velocity over the change in time. This is simply going to be equal to the mass multiplied by the acceleration of the system or the net force on a system. So the net force related to the mass times the acceleration is going to be the derivative of velocity with respect to time. Continuing on with looking at how forces are related to the change in the momentum, we're going to define the impulse to be the force multiplied by the time interval that was acting while a momentum was being changed. So I'm going to use a capital J for that, and I'm going to put a subscript x, so just to say that we're talking about only in the x direction. That's going to be my impulse, and that's going to be equal to the net force, or the sum of forces that are acting on an object, multiplied by the time that these forces were acting on it. So this is kind of the definition of impulse. 
and if we go ahead and we look at the at a graph of the net force over time what that's saying is, is the impulse is going to be the area under that curve if we look at the red curve here that's a very complicated looking force it could be me stretching a string out pulling it harder and harder and harder and then slowly releasing it over some period of time the impulse that I have imparted to that spring is going to be the sum of all those forces multiplied by their tiny little time intervals which is also going to be the area under that curve we can replace that by talking about an average force over the same time interval and here we're going to get that green box that is going to give us the same area the same impulse so why do I really care about impulse well it turns out that the impulse I'll leave this in the x direction is also going to be equal to the change in momentum of a system so if I know how it, that I have some force that acts over some time, then I know how much it's going to change. Uh, then I know what my impulse is, and I know how much it's going to change the momentum of a system. We could just as easily set those two impulses equal to each other and say that the change in momentum is going to be equal to the net force multiplied by the time of a collision and suppose we're talking about a car that is moving with some velocity and it comes to rest it's obviously changed its momentum some force has acted on it over some period of time and the amount that the momentum that the momentum changes is going to be a constant value it's going to be the mass times the velocity and if it's ending at rest the final momentum is going to be zero so that is a number however any no any number of combinations of force and time can be multiplied together to get that number. If we consider a car stopping and that car stops in a very short period of time then that means the force has to be very 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 large. You know this if you've ever slammed on the brakes and came to a screeching halt. However if you applied the brakes over a longer period of time then obviously you felt a much smaller force acting on you as you change your momentum so we can get a smaller force by having the time interval be longer so we talked just briefly about kinetic energy and momentum obviously they are um, you know, in some ways in many ways related they're both related to the mass and the velocity of the object that is in motion however if we look at changes in these quantities changes in the momentum are going to depend over on the time over which the force acts however changes in the kinetic energy are going to depend on the distance over which the force acts you can see this in the figure right here where here I have my definition of work done or kinetic energy gained by a pitcher throwing a ball that's going to be the sum of forces multiplied or dotted with the displacement of the ball if I look at what the change in momentum is that's going to be the sum of the forces multiplied by the um, time interval of the ball so what this is really kind of saying is if you look at a graph of force against distance and that force is going to do something like that then the area under this curve is going to be the work done or the change in kinetic energy however if I look at a graph of force against time and that guy is going to go up and do something like that then the area under this curve is going to be related to the change in momentum so be very careful when you're looking at graphs of force against some quantity um, make sure you look at the bottom axis to see whether we're talking about a change in kinetic energy or a change in 
momentum, it's very easy, easy to get confused between the two. However, there's a very large difference between the two of these. So let's take a look at the impulse that is generated by, from a ball rebounding from a wall. Whenever we're looking at types of collision problems, we're always going to look at a before scenario and after scenario. And beforehand, we have the ball moving towards the wall at some velocity. It's defining this direction to be the negative direction. So we can simply write what the momentum of the ball is before the collision occurs, where the one, typically the book uses one for before and two for after, is simply going to be the mass of the ball multiplied by its velocity. And we're going to come up with a momentum of negative 12 kilogram meter per second. Afterwards, the ball is moving away from the wall. It still has the same mass. Now the velocity is in the positive direction. So I'm going to write P2x, again, the tube, the tube representing after a collision has occurred. It's going to be mass V2x. I'll put my 1x up here. And that's going to give me a momentum of 8 kilograms meter per second. My impulse is simply going to be the change in momentum, or P2x minus P1x, which is going to be 8 minus negative 12, or 20 kilogram meters per second. That's the impulse. I can find the force if I know how long it, the impulse occurred for, simply by knowing that the impulse is equal to the net force multiplied by the change in time. So if the collision occurred for a change in time of, say, 0.01 seconds, I would simply say that the net force is going to be the impulse divided by the change in time, or 20 kilograms meters per second divided by 0 0.01. The net force is going to come out to be 2,000 newtons. Now, one thing that's kind of interesting here is if the ball, say, afterwards just stuck to the ground, then this term right here would have gone to be equal to 0. And that would have gone to be equal to 0. The impulse that was imparted would have only been 8 kilogram meters per second squared. That also means that the force that the fluor exerted would have been much smaller. So bouncing actually transfers more force to the ground than an object simply falling and hitting the ground. Because what it's done is it's taken some force to change the momentum of the ball going down. And then it's also taken some force to essentially push the ball back upwards to change its momentum that way as well. We can, of course, extend this to two dimensions. If we're looking at a soccer ball that is coming into a soccer player's foot only in the x direction, then he kicks it. And afterwards, it has some x and y components. What we can do is we simply write the change in momentum in the x direction and we write the change in momentum in the y direction. And this is going to be equal to some final minus initial. So P2x minus P1x and P2y minus P1y. In this particular case, the ones, again, indicate before the collision occurs. This ball has no momentum 
originally in the y direction. Right? It was coming in just like that. Afterwards, it obviously has some y component. And we can break this guy, this velocity, up into its x and y components. We're experts at that now. Put my y over there and my x over here. And we can figure out what the force is, what the impulse is in each direction. We can figure out what the force should be in each direction and do a vector sum to figure out what that force is and what angle it should be at. Your intuition would say it should be in the positive x and positive y direction. I'll leave it up to you to work through the details of this problem. So, so now we've talked about how forces were, are going to change the momentum of a system. Now let me consider a system such that no external forces are going to act on it. This is called an isolated system. This is a very nice type of system to be working with because it means that we can say that the total momentum of a system of particles is going to be conserved. Being very careful to note that it's a vector sum of the momentum of each particles. I'm going to say, actually I'm going to add the words net in here, I'll talk about that later. The, so if there are no forces acting on a system, the total momentum before a collision occurs is going to be equal to the total momentum after a collision occurs. Let me just take a look at these two astronauts. These two astronauts represent a system where there are no external forces on them. There is no wind or no friction or anything like that. If I had a wind or a system or something like that, I, and if I had a force on them, obviously I'm going to change the momentum of the system. So for this system of, of astronauts, the total momentum is conserved. I can write that the mo momentum beforehand is going to be equal to the momentum after something happens. Now when I said no net external force, um, I want you to now consider instead of two astronauts, but two ice skaters. Obviously these ice skaters are going to have their weights downwards and a normal force upwards acting on each of these two guys. And it turns out that these are external forces. However, if the vector sum of all the external forces is zero, then I can say the same thing. The total momentum of the system is going to be constant and it's going to be conserved. So you can see here how the normal force and weight are going to balance each, each other perfectly. I could not say that the total momentum of the system was conserved if there was, say, friction on the ice skaters as they were pushing off. That is an external force that is not balanced out by anything else. So let me now just write what the momentum of a system would be. Here I have two balls, A and B and I want to write what the total momentum of that system is going to be. That's going to be the momentum of ball A plus the momentum of ball B. And I simply add those two guys together. That is the total momentum of the system. If there are no external forces, then that momentum will always be the value that it is and it will never be changed. If the balls collide or if the balls bounce off of walls or anything like that, the total momentum of the system will always be the sum of those two guys. We have to be very careful to remember that momentum does have direction associated with it. We cannot simply add the momentum of A plus the momentum of B to get 42 kilograms meters per second. We have to add them like vectors, taking into account the angles and all that good stuff when we calculate the total momentum of the system. And in this case, we would calculate you know, a total momentum of the system in the x direction and a total momentum of the system in the y direction.
and add them together like vectors and work that work the problem from there. So let me just simply say what a total momentum of a system would be. My system here is going to be two balls. They each have a mass, each have a velocity. And I would say that the momentum of this system is going to be equal to the momentum of ball A plus the momentum of ball B. And if there were no external forces acting on the, this guy, then this momentum would be conserved. It would always be the same value, reg regardless of whether the balls collided or whether they kept on going in the same direction forever. This momentum value is always going to be the same. That's a very important concept. We have to keep in mind, however, that I don't want to simply add momentum of A being 18, the momentum of B being 24, and come up with 42 kilograms meters per second squared. That is not the correct way to do this. We have to remember that these guys are vectors. So I have to vectorally add the momentum of A to the momentum of B and come up with this total momentum of the system, which is a vector. And it is off to the um, positive x and positive y direction for this case. So let me just really quickly work a conservation of momentum problem. Here we have a rifle firing a bullet. You know intuitively that that's going to cause the bullet to recoil. If I write the momentum of the system beforehand, that's going to be the momentum of the rifle plus the momentum of the bullet, both of which are at rest. So the momentum beforehand is actually going to be 0. Afterwards, we, we know that the bullet is traveling at some velocity. And intuitively we, intuitively, we know that the gun is going to be recoiling. So the momentum after is going to be the mass of the bullet in the x direction multiplied by the velocity of the bullet plus the mass of the rifle multiplied by the velocity of the rifle. I've intentionally left the velocity to be positive, even though I know it's going to be going in the, op in, in the, in this case, negative direction, because the algebra will bring out the negative and tell me which direction my uh, rifle will be recoiling in. And I'll also point out that you're saying, well, there was a force there. Um, the gunpowder caught on fire and it ignited and it pushed the bullet forward, that force was internal to the rifle bullet system. So there are no external forces such as friction or anything like that in the system. Conservation of momentum is going to tell me that the momentum beforehand must be equal to the momentum after. So my momentum, momentum beforehand was equal to 0. And my momentum afterwards is going to be the mass of the bullet, velocity of the bullet. I know what both of those guys are. Plus the mass of the rifle multiplied by the velocity of the rifle. I'm very, very interested in solving for the velocity of the rifle. So I subtract that from both sides and divide by the mass. The velocity of the rifle is going to be the negative mass of the bullet in the x direction multiplied by the velocity of the bullet, divided by the mass of the rifle. And I plug all those guys in, and I come up with negative 0.5 meters per second. Again, what the negative sign there means is simply that the rifle is going in the opposite direction of the bullet. I took the direction of the bullet here to be positive. And we can see that you know the rifle is much, 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 much more massive than the bullet. So it makes sense that the velocity of the rifle is going to be much, much, much smaller than the velocity of the bullet. 
I can look at this for another type of collision where beforehand I have two carts moving in opposite directions, they're going to collide, and afterwards now they're going in opposite directions, I could simply do the same thing. I'm going to look at my, moment, my, my momentum before the collision occurs. That's going to be the mass of A multiplied by the velocity of A. I'm going to put the 1 there to say that it's before a collision, plus the mass of B multiplied by the velocity of B beforehand. I know what all those guys in. I have to take into account directions when I worry about velocity. I can solve for that number. Afterwards, I'm going to say what is my momentum of the system. That is going to be the same thing. It's going to be the mass of cart A multiplied now by its velocity of A, two meaning afterwards, plus mass of cart B multiplied by the velocity of cart B, two meaning afterwards. I know what one of those guys is. I know what these masses are. And up here, I've solved for this number. So now I can go ahead and solve for that velocity right there. I'm leaving this one up to you to solve it yourself and then check your results with the answer.